you're listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello, and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access TV or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast to them i say thank you or you are watching and listening to me on facebook live either on my own personal page or on boston free radio's facebook page either way you could join me i'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic which is movies so i've got a lot to catch up on i was telling my facebook audience that as of right now i have 16 movies that i've seen but have not reviewed for this show that's pretty incredible but first, before I review some of those movies, I'm definitely not going to get all, to all of them today, here is what's topping the box office, the top 10 highest box office grocers of this past weekend. And the movie that's hold, held the number one spot for the last two weeks is an unlikely choice, but still a movie that's doing well. It is Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, which in its four weeks in release has been number two or number one for the last two weeks. This weekend, it grossed $35.4 million against a budget ranging from $90 to $110 million. Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle has so far grossed $291.6 million here in the States and $674.6 million worldwide. So whether or not it cost as little as $90 million, as much as $110 million, one thing is certain that Jumanji is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. The Post is number two at the box office this past weekend, having climbed from, get this, number 15 last week. It wasn't even in the top 10, but in its fourth week in release, it is opened in more theaters and more people are certainly paying attention to this movie. As a matter of fact, when I went to see The Post at the Kendall Square Theater, it was one of the only showings in the Boston area of that movie, and it was packed in Kendall Square. And Kendall Square is a great theater, but it's not a theater that's packed, mainly because of its movie selection. But regardless, this week, The Post grossed $23.4 million just this past weekend. And granted, it was a holiday weekend with Martin Luther King Day, but still, that's very impressive for a movie of that size. Against a budget of $50 million, that's five zero million million, the Post has so far grossed $27.9 million here in the States and $342.8 million worldwide. So the Post is not a hit yet here in the States, but this is the most surprising part. Around the world, the Post is a certified hit by quite a bit, having grossed nearly seven times its budget, and that is unprecedented for a movie like The Post that's not a comic book movie or what have you. The Commuter is the highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's number three at the box office, having grossed $16.4 million. Against a budget of $30 million, The Commuter has so far grossed as I said, $16.4 million here in the States and $22.6 million worldwide. So it's not a hit here in the States or around the world, but it's off to a pretty good start. The Greatest Showman was number four at the box office last week. This week, it is also number four at the box office, having grossed $15.6 million just this past weekend. Against a budget of $84 million, The Greatest Showman has so far grossed $98.4 million here in the States and $198.5 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. Star Wars Episode Eight, The Last Jedi, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, this is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. It only grossed $15.3 million this past weekend, but against a budget of $200 million, it has grossed $595.6 million here in the States and a staggering $1.27 billion worldwide. And I think it's bypassed the gross of the live-action Beauty and the Beast from last year already, but... It goes without saying, it is a certified hit, and even though it hasn't been number one for two weeks, it's still done incredibly well for itself. Better than Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle will probably ever do. 
Paddington 2 is number six at the box office this past weekend and the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, having grossed $15 million even this past weekend against a budget of $50 million. However, around the world, Paddington 2 has so far grossed $150.4 million worldwide. So Paddington 2 is not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. And seeing that Paddington Bear is from Peru and he lives in London, it's no wonder this movie has such international appeal. Insidious, The Last Key, which is the fourth Insidious movie, is number seven of the box office in its second week of release, sliding greatly from number two last week. This weekend, it grossed $14.6 million. Against a budget of $10 million, though, Insidious, The Last Key has so far grossed $50.8 million here in the States and $95 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Proud Mary is the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week, having grossed $12 million this past weekend against a budget ranging from $14 to $30 million. So I can't say what kind of hit this this movie is. Actually, I can say for certain that it is not a hit yet, but I can't tell you the international numbers because I don't have them, but Proud Mary is not off to the greatest start. Pitch Perfect 3 is number 9 at the box office this past weekend, having grossed $7.3 million. Against a budget of $45 million, though, Pitch Perfect 3 has so far grossed $96.3 million here in the States and $162.4 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And finally, Darkest Hour, number 10 at the box office this weekend, sliding from number 8 last week, having grossed $5.6 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $30 million, Darkest Hour has so far grossed $36.8 million here in the States and $54.7 million worldwide, which means that It isn't as promising as The Post in terms of box office numbers, but I can tell you right from the get-go that Darkest Hour is a tentative hit here in the States and a a tentative hit around the world, but is very, very close to being a certified hit around the world. And judging from the fact that Winston Churchill is considered an international hero, it wouldn't surprise me if this movie surpassed into... Driving has a rhythm all its own. Don't wreck it with a text. Before you get behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. These are not just academic exercises. A world run by a handful of greedy bankers can't possibly last. The only solution is to fight. I'm going to tell you a number of things, but you really only have to remember two words. Governments lie. New England Unsettler. Mondays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just a reminder that Words on Film is... You're currently listening to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. You're watching on Somerville Community Access TV or some community access TV station that has picked up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to, excuse me, the first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Post. Now, normally I wouldn't review this movie first, but considering that it climbed all the way to number two this past week and is generating a lot of Oscar buzz, I decided to make an exception with it. As I said before in the break, there are 16 movies, including The Post, that I have yet to review for this show. Four of them I'm going to review for this show, including The Post, but there are a lot of them that I couldn't quite 
fit in for this show. But rest assured, they are coming at one point or another. This is actually a great problem to have, to have too many movies to review for this show, because a lot of times, especially towards the end of the year, I have too little. But regardless, The Post is a movie about the Washington Post, with Meryl Streep as Washington Post publisher Catherine K. Graham, and Tom Hanks as chief editor of the Washington Post, Ben Bradley. Now, a lot of you movie buffs will probably remember that Ben Bradley was previously portrayed in an Oscar-winning performance by Jason Robards in one of my favorite all-time movies, All the President's Men, and one of the best movies about journalism ever. So, even though Tom Hanks has two Academy Award wins to his name and several nominations, he has some very big shoes to fill when playing Ben Bradley, but he did well in this movie. So is this a movie about the history of the Washington Post? Not exactly, but certainly a crucial moment that really defined what free speech was in this country. So a little bit of background on the Post. It starts in 1965 when State Department military analyst Daniel Ellsberg accompanied U.S. troops into combat and documented the process of U.S. military activities in the region for Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Now, on the return flight home from Vietnam, Daniel Ellsberg expresses his doubts to both Robert McNamara and the president at the time, Lyndon Baines Johnson, about the war in Vietnam, and he declares it hopeless. Now, his calls get ignored, but eventually, years later, when Daniel Ellsberg becomes a civilian military contractor, he surreptitiously photocopies classified reports documenting the process of the ongoing Vietnam War, which places a lot of blame on President Johnson, President Kennedy, President Eisenhower, and even President Truman, taking blame for going into the Vietnam War, even though these presidents knew it would be a losing battle. So these documents became the Pentagon Papers. And eventually, Mr. Ellsberg, who is actually still alive, leaks these papers to the New York Times. So Eventually, the Washington Post gets the papers, and the lead-up to this movie is whether or not to publish these papers. On the one hand, there's the free speech issue, but on the other hand, there's the controversy in publishing classified documents. Now, this has been a very contentious issue for a while, but but it's most especially contentious now, considering that there are a lot of leaks coming from today's White House with President Trump, And there's a lot of the ongoing ties to Russia investigation. And, of course, if you hear anything from Donald Trump at all, it's that there's no collusion between him and the Russians. But that has yet to be determined by the Mueller investigation. But there are also some other leaks coming from the Trump White House. And my educated guess is that the reason that The Post is so popular, reaching number two, beating every single movie this past weekend except Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, is that there is more corruption going on in the White House right now than there was during the Nixon administration. And Donald Trump's presidency is far more controversial than that of Nixon for several reasons. So a movie like The Post is bringing to mind some contentious issues then that are very contentious right now. As a matter of fact, the leaking of classified documents, particularly with the internet now, is so much easier than it used to be, which is why WikiLeaks has become a thing. And to be honest with you, I think it was the right thing, obviously, for the Washington Post and the New York Times to publish the Pentagon Papers. I'm not so sure if WikiLeaks and Julian Assange is doing the right thing. I'm also very divided on whether... Edward Snowden is a hero or a, a, a disgrace to Americans. I really couldn't answer that question, but one thing that made this movie great is not only a subject, but also the acting talent involved. 
especially Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks. And they are actors who are so good and so iconic that it really shouldn't come as any surprise to anyone that they're great in this movie. I don't think that Tom Hanks tops Jason Robards' performance in All the President's Men as they play the same person, but I do think Tom Hanks does a commendable job. Also noteworthy are many of the supporting actors, probably most especially Bob Odenkirk. And you're used to seeing Bob Odenkirk in many comedies, both on TV and in movies, particularly Mr. Show. And even his role in Breaking Bad and the spinoff Better Call Saul were comical, but here... He's not quite as funny, but he's still a great supporting actor. And if he does, if he gets nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, I would not be surprised. But on top of that, The Post is a very well-directed film by Steven Spielberg, of all people. And I didn't exa- actually know that Steven Spielberg directed this until the ending credits rolled. But it doesn't top All the President's Men or Spotlight, but it is an excellent journalism movie. I think one that's going to be shown to journalism students year from now, years from now. And it gets my rating of a knockout. Not only is it a good, timely reminder of... The, the times we're living in right now, and the relationship between the press and the government, but it's also an excellent film on so many levels and one of my top ten favorite films of the year. I spent a lot of time in the garage, but even more time in the rain and mud. In 95, I helped tow your moving trailer. And in 09, it was sparks from me, your chains, dragging behind your truck that accidentally started a wildfire. Spark a change, not a wildfire. Visit SmokeyBear.com, brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on BostonFreeRadio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more, making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Commuter. This is the latest action thriller starring Liam Neeson. And it debuted at number three this week, but it's... uh, I I don't think it, it should have been that high. It... It's not a bad movie. I'm going to get into exactly what it's about and what what I think about it specifically in a moment. But it's one of those films. It's kind of another year, another Liam Neeson movie. And Liam Neeson is still playing the tough guy he's been playing for the last couple of years since Taken. He certainly found a niche, but I'm not exactly sure if this retread that Liam Neeson is going through is really worth it. But anyway, what is The Commuter about? Well, The Commuter is about a businessman who is caught up in a criminal conspiracy during his daily commute home. Because apparently when Liam Neeson was on a plane, that wasn't thrilling enough. So eventually, I think it's going to be one of those things where sooner or later, Liam Neeson is going to be in a movie where he takes an Uber and it becomes the Uber from hell. Because it just seems to be that if there's some transportation device that Liam Neeson has been on, well, let let me put it to you this way. There's danger in just about every transportation device, and Liam Neeson is going to milk all of them. And The Commuter is a movie that certainly had its thrills, but for the first half hour, it dragged considerably. And it really took a while for the conflict in the movie to get going. And Liam Neeson plays a good tough guy. Actually, in this movie, he is a resident of New York City, or rather, New York State. He commutes to and from New York City every day for business. But he's actually playing an Irishman, as he is a a native Irishman. And I thought that was a good move, because one of the things I hate is Liam Neeson not even trying to cover up his Irish accent when he's supposed to play an American. But I'm even more annoyed when actors like Kevin Costner do the opposite. But in any event, Liam Neeson is an Irish immigrant, who's doing pretty well for himself as a as an insurance salesman until he actually gets fired. So on his way home, he 
is told by Walt or one of his friends that a woman is observing him. And eventually this woman, whose name is Joanna, who's played by Vera Farmiga, tells him that there is a compartment on the train containing $25,000. And she tells him that he can have it in addition to another $75,000 in cash as long as he helps find someone before the last stop at Cold Spring at Cold Spring, New York, which is where the, the train ends. So the person is using the alias Prin, and he or she has a bag that contains something he or she stole. And if you know anything about commuter rails in New York City or even big cities like Boston, you know there are a lot of people on the train with a lot of bags. So... Michael uses his skills as a former cop to determine who Prin is and what is in the bag. And there's also an, an instruction he's given where he's supposed to kill this person named Prin. So this movie already kind of reminds me of not just one Twilight Zone episode, but several of them. And by the end, even though the running time of this movie is only about one hour and 45 minutes, I found myself towards the one hour mark thinking to myself, okay, this is really frustrating. Just find the person and get this movie over with. Because as you might expect, it's cliche that a movie like this would have twists. And it's a cl it's cliche that the twist would be that somebody who you think is a friend or an adversary of Liam Neeson's character would be the villain here. And I'm not spoiling very much, but it is basically the same Liam Neeson movie, kind of like Taken, over and over again. Liam Neeson is supposed to play a normal guy who, amidst strenuous circumstances, becomes a tough guy, and it just... There was nothing new here for me in terms of storytelling, in terms of Liam Neeson's performance, in terms of anything. And yes, there are stories on a train that can be thrilling, but unfortunately, Liam Neeson has already done movies where he's been a passenger on a plane preventing a terrorist attack. I forgot the name of that movie, but I saw it a couple of years ago, and I wasn't particularly impressed by that movie so much so that I remember that Liam Neeson's in it. I remember that Julianne Moore was in that movie and Lupita Nyong'o. These are actors that I really like, but I don't really remember any details within the movie. And I don't think that anybody who sees this movie or who has seen it is going to remember the details of this movie two weeks from now. So by no means is The Commuter a bad movie. And I've got about less than two minutes to discuss this film, but it gets my rating of a strikeout. Again, it, it certainly has its thrills, and by the end, the action begins to pick up and things get begin to get a little bit more interesting, but it's a movie that I overall did not think was clever. I didn't think it was surprising. I think Liam Neeson is kind of phoning it in with all these tough guy roles. And it's a shame because Liam Neeson is very much like Nicolas Cage in the sense that he is a very good actor. 20 years ago, he received a lot of accolades, deserved accolades for his performances. But now he's making very questionable f film decisions. And he's not playing anybody particularly new in these mainstream movies. I, I, I say in these mainstream movies because there was a movie he was in last year called Silence, which was highly underrated, by the way, received far fewer Academy Award nominations than it should have, and was directed by Martin Scorsese. He did well in that role. He didn't play a tough guy. He played somebody who was very... Um, multifaceted and, and a round character. But here... It's just it's it's disappointing to watch Liam Neeson play basically the same character he's played in Taken and all three Taken movies. And I wouldn't be surprised, unfortunately, if he was in a movie called Taken 4, if somebody took his dog. Again, it sounds absurd, but my guess is that the the typecasting that Liam Neeson is experiencing is so great that eventually a movie like that will come around. And if not, it'll just be under another name.
the Western Scrub Jay. I was taking my science class on a virtual reality bird watching expedition. All of a sudden, Charlie Kane shouts, Arf! Arf! He had spotted the elusive black swift, a bird rarely seen in the wild. For a brief moment, Charlie had not the eyes of a nine-year-old boy. He had the eyes of an eagle. Teachers just have better work stories. Find out how creative teaching can be at teachdfw.org. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson, and I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Paddington 2, which is, of course, the sequel to the 2014 movie Paddington, which I liked a lot better than I thought I would. And the same could be said for Paddington 2. As a matter of fact, the one I saw Paddington 2 and I did my research for this show, what I didn't realize was that the first movie was not called Paddington Bear, even though it could have been. It was just simply called Paddington. I I don't know why they did that, but in any event, didn't hurt the first movie at all because Paddington from 2014 on a budget of 38.5 million pounds or 50 to 55 million US dollars grossed 268 million US dollars worldwide and so far Paddington 2 in just one weekend has grossed 150.4 million dollars worldwide and may just may surpass its predecessor but if it does I think it it's definitely worth it because I was really charmed by Paddington 2. So when we first left Paddington Bear, he was, first of all, adopted by the Brown family and was formerly known as Paddington Brown, not Paddington Bear. And now that he's happily settled with the Brown family and actually a popular member of the local London community in which he lives, he picks up a series of odd jobs to buy the perfect present for his Aunt Lucy's 100th birthday, only for the gift to be stolen. So the director of this movie is Paul King, and Paul King directed the original Paddington movie as well as some other films and TV shows that might be more familiar to British audiences than American audiences, such as The Pajama Men, Last Stand to Reason, which was a TV movie, and also another one called The Mighty Boosh, which was a TV show that aired on the BBC from 2004 to 2007. What a boosh is, I don't know, but in any event, he directs a good movie, and Paddington 2 is certainly no exception. So, uh, many of the original cast members from the first movie reprised their roles in this film. Ben Wishaw reprises his role as Paddington. Also, Sally Hawkins and Hugh Bonneville reprise their roles as Mary and Henry Brown. There's also a brief adversary or or a brief antagonist who was from the original movie as well. I should really write these cast members down. But in any event, Paddington 2 is about to buy a gift for his Aunt Lucy. And Aunt Lucy is a bear who's voiced by Imelda Staunton, who is an Academy Award-nominated British actress. But you don't see her in here. You only hear her voice from the stop-motion, or rather the motion-capture animation character she plays. So 
Paddington finds a pop-up book at a local antique shop that turns out to be more expensive than he anticipated because it is one of the only ones of its kind. So he makes the mistake of mentioning to a local actor who's played in this movie by Hugh Grant, and Hugh Grant's name is Phoenix Buchanan, who was kind of like Troy McClure of The Simpsons. He was somebody who used to be a big actor years ago, but now does dog food commercials in the London area. So Paddington makes the mistake of telling Hugh Grant that this, that this pop-up book exists, and Hugh Grant uses it to crack some kind of code like the Da Vinci Code in order to create some sort of treasure. He ends up breaking into the antique shop of Mr. Gruber, who's played in this movie by Jim Broadbend, and even though Paddington Bear sees Hugh Grant break in and tries to stop him, Paddington is ultimately framed for the crime and sentenced to 10 years in prison. So the the movie shows Paddington going into a prison and doing hard time there. It's very unrealistic how the prison is in this movie. I think it's probably prison from the perspective of children as they read books about it, but Oz it is not. Um, <laughs> so it's it's pretty unrealistic, the, the prison in this movie, but don't take it for face value. And while I did hope that kids see this movie and say, oh, going to jail or going to prison isn't all that bad, well, <laughs> I think kids are smarter than that. But in any event, the, the scenes where Paddington Bale, Bear is in jail or in prison, I should say, because there is a difference between jail and prison, are actually pretty fun moments. And the rapport he has with the other prisoners, particularly a large chef who's a fellow inmate, um, and his character, I can't believe I'm blanking on this. Well, anyway, his character is the the, the rough guy who kind of warms up to to Paddington. His character's name is Knuckles McGinty, and he's played by a British actor by the name of Brendan Gleeson, who you would know instantly from movies like Cavalry and In Bruges, not to mention Cold Mountain, although you probably wouldn't recognize him in this movie because he has a beard and probably looks bigger in this movie than he actually is. Well, he's six foot two, which is pretty tall, but here in this movie he looks probably to be six foot seven. But then again, that's in comparison with Paddington Bear himself, who is very short. So I loved Paddington 2 a lot more than I thought I would. And it certainly is um, on par with the original movie. And just like Nicole Kidman in the first movie making a great bad guy, I thought that Hugh Grant not only made a really good conniving villain in this film not so not so much vindictive as nicole kidman's character from the last movie but certainly a delight to watch and hugh grant plays a great cad in most of the films he's in and here he takes his caddish nature and makes a convincing villain not to mention a funny villain in addition to that I loved paddington bear himself he was charming as heck and i i do think that Families will enjoy this, not only kids, but also the parents who are taking their kids to see this film. And it gets my rating of a knockout. I think this is the first great film of 2018. And while it's too soon to tell whether it's going to be in my top ten list for next year, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. It, it's, it certainly is worth watching. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States and the Ad Council. You're listening to Boston Free Radio. All things fresh, live, and local on bostonfreeradio.com. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our 
beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society. Race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Proud Mary, which, contrary to the name, which is, of course, the name of a famous Creedence Clearwater Revival song that was remade by Solomon Burke and probably most famously the Ike and Tina Turner review. Proud Mary does not take place in New Orleans, and Proud Mary is the name of a person, not a steamboat. But in any event, the Ike and Tina Turner version of the song, which is credited only to Tina Turner in this movie for some reason, it makes an appearance in this film, as you might expect. But Proud Mary is a woman in this movie played by Taraji P. Henson, whose character's name is Mary Goodwin. And she is a successful hit woman working for an organized crime family in Boston. This organized crime family, by the way, is mostly comprised of African-American members, not, as you might expect, Italian members or Russian members. Um, But anyway... Her life is completely shifted when she meets a young boy named Danny, who's played by relative newcomer Jahai Diallo Winston, whose path she crosses when a professional hit goes wrong, and she leaves the boy orphaned. So, Proud Mary is a film that was filmed in and takes place in Boston. And it's not so much unusual for films to be to be filmed in Boston and take place in Boston nowadays because Boston along with Atlanta, Georgia are, is becoming a a new hub for films that are coming out these days. It's not just films that are primarily done in New York and LA, even though they have the bulk of them. Boston's a big town for filming now as well. And it probably has been since the success of mystic river back in 2003. So, While it's not unusual for films to take place in Boston, it is very unusual for films to take place in Boston with a predominantly African-American cast because probably African-Americans are the least represented represented group of people in Boston movies. So I liked the fact that there is a Boston movie with a predominantly African-American cast and how you get to see other neighborhoods of Boston like Dorchester and Jamaica Plain that have heavier African-American populations than other parts of Boston, like Southie, for instance. But also, Taraji P. Henson as an action hero, I can totally get behind that. As a matter of fact, as I was watching this film, I was thinking to myself, there are almost no movies with African-American heroines who are not reluctant to kick ass. I mean, probably the last African-American lead actress in a movie who was a genuine action hero was Pam Greer, or maybe even the woman who played Cleopatra Jones, whose name I, I can't really remember. It wasn't Pam Greer, but it was somebody else. But yeah, it's been a very long time. Usually if African American women like Halle Berry are the lead in an action film, they're usually a reluctant heroine. Not not somebody who is skilled at um fighting arts or even guns or or anything like that. So Proud Mary takes a risk there, but unfortunately this is a movie that really disappointed me because the plot should have been much easier than it ultimately was, and I couldn't exactly tell who was the good guy, who was the bad guy in this movie. Obviously, Proud Mary herself, Taraji P. Henson, is unquestionably the good guy. But I'm not sure if the organization she was working for was meant to be bad or 
or if it was or if it was the Russian mafia who her organized crime unit fights that's supposed to be bad. I just didn't know. Was it supposed to be both? Well, considering that the leader of her organized crime unit is a man by the name of Benny, who's played by Danny Glover, in his first villainous role in literally about 20 years, I really wasn't sure, because I've seen other movies in which Danny Glover has been the villain. Movies like Switchback and Witness, and in that movie, he was unmistakably the villain. Actually, in Switchback, which was a pretty good movie, it had its flaws, but Danny Glover's performance wasn't one of them. It was one of those things where Danny Glover being the bad guy was a little bit of a spoiler alert, but not really. More of the twist of the movie, because when you first meet Danny Glover in that movie, he's a very likable person. In this movie, he was very likable. In fact, throughout the movie, he was particularly likable. So, when... Proud Mary, or rather Taraji P. Henson's character, begins to exact revenge on him, and I'm not going to tell you how it goes, you're, you're wondering, well, is he really the, the bad person in this film? Because in the first 30 minutes of the film, you weren't exactly sure. In addition to that, the pacing of this movie was really uneven, and there were parts where I found myself nodding off. So even though I like... Taraji P. Henson a lot. I think she is great in just about every role she's in, in movies or in TV. She can make a convincing hero, but she can also make a really good villain. Um, but here, I just thought, even though she did her best, there were so many things about this movie that was lacking, and I do think that one of the first movies to portray African Americans in the Boston area deserved much better than this film. So Proud Mary gets my rating of a strikeout, particularly because there are moments in this movie that are retread, and there are also climactic moments that, because of the sluggish pace of some of the other parts of this movie, felt didn't feel quite as satisfactory as they should have been. Plus, the ending was way too brief. I, I, I thought it was cut off way too soon in the beginning. Or rather, b before you could really get a satisfactory ending. So the director of this movie is an Iranian man by the name of Babak Najafi, who has directed several movies in Sweden, uh, which was his adopted country. He's only directed two movies in the United States. One was Proud Mary. The other one, unfortunately, was London Has Fallen, which I regarded as one of the worst movies of 2016, even though it had... Morgan Freeman and Aaron Eckhart co-starring in it. So I don't want to pick on a, a guy who has been through so much to get through to the United States, but Proud Mary is just not that good. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move. All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and this is usually the part of the show where I review another one of the movies I've seen. Now, I said at the beginning of the show that there are 16 movies that I haven't reviewed for this show yet. I've seen them, but I haven't reviewed them. Well, I've, I've just crossed four of them off the list, and so now I have 12. So normally I'd get into another movie review, but this time, since the Oscar nominations are going to be announced next week, I'm going to get into a segment bar borrowed from Siskel and Ebert, which is called 
a memo to the Academy. And this is where I give a list of the movies and some of the actors, actresses, and maybe other personnel on movies as well that I think should be nominated for Oscars. And I am taking into account the Golden Globe nominees and winners, but overall, there are a few movies that were not nominated for Oscars that I think should have been. So, here are my picks for Best Picture. Now, my rule for Best Picture is no documentaries, since documentaries are seldom considered in the Best Picture category, and also maximum of 10 choices, because that's the maximum of choices that the Academy has. So, if I were to choose 10 movies to be nominated for Best Picture, they would be as follows. The Big Sick, Coco, Darkest Hour, Detroit, Dunkirk, Get Out, Lady Bird, The Post, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Those are my top 10 choices. Now, amongst those choices, Coco was nominated for Best Animated Feature, but it wasn't nominated for Best Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy for the Golden Globes. But I think in addition to it being nominated for Best Animated Feature at the Oscars, which it will be, there's no question about it, it will be, but I think it also should be nominated for Best Picture. Also... Detroit is probably the only movie on this list that didn't receive any Golden Globe nominations, and I think that is a big mistake. The, the reason is because not only was Detroit my pick for best movie of 2017, I also think it is highly underrated. And anyone, just about everyone I know who saw this movie, including critics whose reviews I've read, loved it. And then... Around August, when it was making its way out of theaters, it somehow got lost in the shuffle. I do think that it's great that movies that came out last February, like Get Out, is getting the award season recognition that they deserve. But it is really unfortunate that Get Out, uh, excuse me, that Detroit got lost in the shuffle because my memo to the Academy is. Consider Detroit. Consider it for Best Picture. Also consider some of the supporting performances in the movie. And while I have that in mind, I'm going to actually look that movie up on IMDb so I don't get lost in thought as I usually do. So, to um, sort of member of the Academy, but also a little bit of a, a retread of the winners and nominees of the Golden Globes. So, Best Motion Picture Drama. I know that the Golden Globes happened over a week ago, but I didn't cover them for last week's show. Best Motion Picture Drama. The nominees were Call Me By Your Name, Dunkirk, The Post, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now, four out of five of these films, I think, should be nominated for Best Picture if they're not... Con considered already call me by your name i think is the only one that that doesn't need to be there but it could be nominated and if it is i wouldn't be against it that's a movie i've seen but i haven't reviewed for this show but the winner of best motion picture for drama surprisingly i would have picked dunkirk but the winner was three billboards outside ebbing missouri now that movie three billboards outside ebbing missouri takes a long time to say uh, comparatively long but it it almost made my top 10, but I did think that probably Dunkirk should have won. But moving on to Best Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. This is the Golden Globes again. The nominees were I, Tanya, The Disaster Artist, Get Out, Lady Bird, and The Greatest Showman. And the winner was Lady Bird. And I think that was a deserved win, uh, particularly amongst the nominees that were there. I would be very surprised to see I, Tanya be nominated for Best Picture. It could be, and I think that the performances in the movie, particularly by the likes of Alice and Janney, could be shoo-ins for Oscar nominations. Margot Robbie, I don't think should be nominated, but I, I thought she did a serviceable job. I just still stand by my opinion that she was miscast for that movie. However, Lady Bird, I think you're going to see a lot of nominations for that movie. Maybe not for Best Director, but certainly Saoirse Ronan for Best Actress. Possibly 
Laurie Metcalf for Best Supporting Actress. There's a high probability of that. The Disaster Artist, I'll get to that movie a little bit later, but here are the nominees for Best Motion, best Performance by an Actress in a Motion Picture Drama. The nominees are Sally Hawkins, The Shape of Water, Jessica Chastain, Molly's Game, Frances McDormand, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Meryl Streep for The Post, and Michelle Williams for All the Money in the World. Of these five actresses, if there was one I probably wouldn't nominate, it would, I think probably two actually, it would be Jessica Chastain for Molly's Game and Michelle Williams for All the Money in the World. But Frances McDormand won this category for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, and I think it's great that she was nominated. She certainly deserved to be, and I think a memo to the Academy is include Frances McDormand. I don't think they're not going to include Meryl Streep for The Post, and I think that unlike last year when Meryl Streep was nominated for Florence Foster Jenkins, she actually deserves to be nominated this year for The Post. Sally Hawkins, too, for The Shape of Water. So now on to Best Performance by an Actor in a Motion Picture Drama. The nominees are, or the nominees for the Golden Globes were, Timothy Chalamet for Call Me By Your Name, Daniel Day-Lewis, The Phantom Thread, Tom Hanks for The Post, Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour, and Denzel Washington for Roman J. Israel Esquire. The winner of this category was Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour, which I think also was a deserved award, especially considering the transformation through which Gary Oldman went to portray Winston Churchill. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Continuing with my discussion about my memo to the Academy and also a rundown of the nominees and winners for Golden Globe, which I sort of intersect with my memo to the Academy. Of the nominees for Actor in a Motion Picture, there are some great ones here. If I were to drop one, it would probably be Timothy Chalamet for Call Me By Your Name. Now, he did a great job in that movie, and I'm going to review that film much later on or in the next coming weeks on my show. But Gary Oldman deserved to win. He deserves to be nominated as well. Denzel Washington most certainly deserves to be nominated for Roman J. Israel Esquire. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis did great in Phantom Thread. I wouldn't be surprised to see him nominated either. And Tom Hanks for The Post, He maybe not a shoe in and he certainly has Jason Robards to uh, compete against, I think, in a lot of people's minds, particularly movie buffs like myself. But Tom Hanks also has a really good chance of being nominated. And I think that four out of the five in the motion picture actor for drama deserve to be there. So moving on. Now here's the best performance by an actress in a motion picture, musical or comedy. The nominees were, for Golden Globes, Judy Dench, Victorian Abdul, Helen Mirren, The Leisure Seeker, Saoirse Ronan, Lady Bird, Margot Robbie, I, Tanya, and Emma Stone for Battle of the Sexes. The winner for this category was Saoirse Ronan for Lady Bird, and I think she deserves to be nominated as well. As for Helen Mirren, I have not seen The Leisure Seeker, so I can't say whether or not she should be nominated. Margot Robbie probably should not be nominated for I, Tanya. Again, she was nominated for a Golden Globe, but I didn't think she did that great as Tanya Harding. She did a serviceable job, but I still attest that she was miscast because 
Margot Robbie is excep- exceptionally beautiful, and Tanya Harding is fair. You know, it, it may seem like a harsh critique for Margot Robbie. I mean, hey, cr- critiquing somebody for being exceptionally beautiful, that's not the harshest thing to say. But I, I think when you look at her eyes and see how exotic they look, it immediately takes you out of the movie and you think to yourself, you know, the Tanya Harding I see on screen could make a living modeling as opposed to figure skating. But the real-life Tanya Harding couldn't do that. Not that she's unattractive, but I'm just saying. Uh, Judy Dench, I would not be surprised to see nominated for Victorian Abdul. And Emma Stone is a possible shoe-in for Battle of the Sexes. But again, if she's not nominated, I wouldn't be heartbroken. So, best performance by an actor in a motion picture, musical, or comedy. The nominees are Daniel Kaluuya for Get Out, Steve Carell, Battle of the Sexes, Ansel Elgort, Baby Driver, James Franco, The Disaster Artist, and Hugh Jackman for The Greatest Showman. The winner in this category was James Franco for The Disaster Artist. And honestly, James Franco was good in The Disaster Artist, but I actually thought his brother Dave Franco was better. I I think, as I said in my original review for The Disaster Artist, it's easy for an actor to play a weird guy. That's not difficult. But I thought that... Dave Franco's performance as Greg Sestero was much more nuanced, and I I just didn't really think that James Frank, Franco's performance was better than Dave Franco's. I, I, I thought that Dave Franco, for arguably the first time in his career, exceeded James Franco in performance, but... If, if I, I would nominate Dave Franco over James Franco, if neither of them get nominated, I would like to see Daniel Kaluuya be nominated for Get Out because he had a, a performance that was not only great but also really iconic. The scene where he's hypnotized and you actually look into his eyes, that's probably one of the most iconic moments of the film year 2017. So moving on to Best Performance by an Actress in a Motion... In, in a supporting role. The nominees are Mary J. Blige, Mudbound, Hong Chua for Downsizing, Lori Metcalf for Lady Bird, Allison Janney for I, Tanya, and Octavia Spencer for The Shape of Water. So I don't think Hong Chua should be nominated for Downsizing. I did not like her performance in the film. So I would X her out. Allison Janney, I think, should be nominated. She did an amazing job in I, Tanya. Laurie Metcalf should also be nominated. Mary J. Blige, I can't say because I haven't seen Mudbound yet. And Octavia Spencer, I think she would probably work well for The Shape of Water. Now, here are the nominees for Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role. I only have a few minutes left. Actually, you know what? I, I don't have time for this. Anyway, I'm sorry to wrap this up. I probably should have dedicated another segment to my memo to the Academy, but you've been listening to the show Words on Film, which is a spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. I will be back next week, not only with more reviews, but also my take on the nominees for the Oscars, which will literally be announced moments before my show. So until then, this is your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, saying I'll see you at the movies. 